Hey friends, welcome back to the journal feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place where I get to spoon feed you guys the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. Now, if you're hearing this right now, then you are not currently a part of the members feed. So you're not going to be receiving the full journal feed podcast, only getting a portion of the past week's articles. Don't worry, they're all good articles. But if you would like to get full access to both the podcast and of course the blog, then you'll have to become a member. All the details for that are at journalfeed.org. And remember, we never want money to be a barrier to better patient care. So if you're having any trouble affording a subscription, just get in touch. We'll help you out. This is the audio version of the past week summaries, which were brought to you by our authors, Joshua Belfer, Jason Lesnick, Kitan Patel, Dendrick Cooper, and Clay Smith. Okay, we're going to skip straight to the second article. Titled, Performance of Fembrile Infant Algorithms by Duration of Fever, out of the journal Pediatrics. Now, my own hospital actually asks this question in our little algorithm that you fill out to tell us what to do within five. You know, I've never really thought that much about the duration of a fever in an infant. We check all these inflammatory markers, but if you haven't had a fever for very long, then maybe you haven't had the chance to ramp up those inflammatory markers, and they might not be as good tests. This is definitely something worth looking into. You know, my own hospital actually asked this question about how long they've had a fever, and I never really gave it that much thought. We have sort of an algorithm that we fill out to tell us what to do with febrile infants. And... I never really thought it was super relevant, but now maybe I'm going to give that a second thought. So, this was a single center cohort of febrile infants less than 90 days old, and it was a sort of a secondary analysis of more than 2,500 infants who were analyzed to look at the performance of biomarkers that were used in the PCARN, AAP, or step-by-step clinical decision algorithms according to how long the infant has had a fever less than 2 hours, 2 to 12 hours, or more than 12 hours of fever. Overall, almost 25% of the febrile infants seen were seen within 2 hours of their fever starting, accounting for about a third of the total invasive bacterial infections from this cohort. Alright, so if we're looking at common biomarkers, the white blood cell count, the absolute neutrophil count, the CRP, then we see that these were not having the great characteristics that we usually see if the febrile infant presented with less than two hours of fever. They're the worst test characteristics with shorter durations of fever. Procalcitonin, on the other hand, no matter when they came in with their fever, less than two hours to more than 12 hours, uh, still had similar test characteristics. So you go procalcitonin. Each of the three clinical decision rules that they tested actually had the lowest sensitivity if the febrile infant presented less than two hours from their onset of fever. Interestingly, the highest sensitivity was seen by -by step-by-step if the infant was between 2 and 12 hours, and PCARN and the AAP rules were best if the febrile infant presented with more than 12 hours of fever. Now, of course, this is just from a single center, and it's hard to say that this will generalize to everywhere, but I'm going to take a little bit of caution from looking at these results. This is really interesting stuff to me. Of course, how well can I trust that as soon as the patient had a fever that it was measured by the parents? So there's probably a gap between truly how long there was a fever and just the time since measuring the fever. This makes me a little bit worried that unfortunately, perhaps the, well, quote unquote, best parents are going to be the ones at highest risk of missing a serious infection in these children. Because they recognize a fever early and they brought their child in quickly, They get the soonest assessment, and if these are the infants who are most at risk of us not having good test characteristics for our algorithms, oh, that would be so unfortunate for these parents who are the most vigilant. So the question now is, what should you do with this information? You could retest the infant after a couple of hours. They're still probably going to be in your emergency department because the tests haven't come back yet. Or potentially, you could just wait until it's been at least two hours since fever onset. But then you're running the risk of what if they do have a serious infection and you're not treating it and you're just delaying things in those circumstances that could be potentially dangerous for the infant. Although I wouldn't think that just delaying up to two hours would be terribly dangerous. But there is data showing that, you know, kids, and even adults with sepsis, it is nice to get the treatment in as soon as possible. 
So it's hard to say what to do with this. I would like to see more data on this. Can we delay just to two hours? Would that be okay? Most of the infants aren't even coming in within two hours of their fever. So maybe it wouldn't be the worst thing. And it really, it's not going to be delaying two hours in the emergency department. If they come in an hour, you're just delaying one hour to take those labs. So I'm not sure. I'm a little bit torn on this. If I had an infant come in at an hour and a half since fever onset, I would be tempted to delay doing that poke by just 30 minutes, just for a little bit better test characteristics. Perhaps. I don't want to miss anything. But I also don't want to delay treating these infants. It's going to be up to you on that one, I guess. In a spoonful, in a cohort of febrile infants, the test characteristics of biomarkers were worse if the child presented within two hours of their fever onset. However, the procalcitonin still worked pretty well. So as long as you've got a procalcitonin, probably just draw the labs as soon as the infant arrives. And then we skip to the fourth article. Titled Comparison of Nebulized Ketamine to Intravenous Subdissociative Dose Ketamine for Treating Acute Painful Conditions in the Emergency Department, a prospective randomized double-blind double-dummy control trial out of the Annals of Emergency Medicine. All right, guys, we've talked about ketamine for pain before on the podcast. Uh, just a little while ago, we saw a meta-analysis which compared ketamine versus morphine, both weight-based dosing, and we saw that ketamine was pretty much equivalent to morphine up to two hours out, which is quite impressive for ketamine considering it's a very safe drug. We can give it to just about anybody. Now, this is looking at ketamine via a different route, nebulized ketamine. There's already a lot of studies out there that look at intranasal ketamine, but I don't know about you, but I'd rather probably just breathe in some mist than have something sprayed up my nose. So nebulized ketamine might be a nice option. It's pretty non-invasive, it's pretty easy to put on someone, and it could still control their pain. This is an interesting topic. This was a prospective, randomized, double-blind, double-dummy trial of 150 adult patients. So double dummy, meaning that they were administered both a nebulized solution and an intravenous solution at the same time, no matter which treatment group they were in, but they were randomized and blinded to which one they were getting, either nebulized ketamine and then saline intravenously or ketamine intravenously and saline nebulized, which is an interesting and very rigorous way of conducting this trial. Very happy for you guys. The intravenous ketamine was given at 0.3 milligrams per kg, which I'd say is a good dose for pain control for IV ketamine. And nebulized ketamine was given at 0.75 milligrams per kg. Pain scores 30 minutes post-administration were measured as the primary outcome, but they also took pain scores later out than that, up to about two hours. All right, and what did they see between the groups? Well, honestly, pain was pretty much the same. The levels of pain on a 11-point scale were similar at all the time points, including their primary outcome of 30 minutes. There was no serious adverse events noted in either group along the entire study, which is pretty much what we expect. Ketamine, particularly low-dose ketamine, is very safe. However, if you look at the rescue medication rates, then you see that the nebulized group got more rescue medications, which is weird because the time points and the pain ratings seem to be the same between both groups. So why do they get rescue medications and the otherwise don't? I am never sure why this happens sometimes in these pain groups. However, if you look at the nebulized group, you see that they got more rescue analgesia, which I never understand if they're still rating their pain the same. So it's always hard, a little bit hard to comment on. However, if you look at the nebulized group, you see that they got more rescue analgesia, even though they didn't rate their pain any higher. So it's always a little bit hard to understand, but needing rescue analgesia is certainly a marker that probably your pain wasn't as well controlled, but not enough so that you told the people that your pain was different. Always hard to comment on. A limitation from this study was that they did not take all comers. Instead, they selected patients that they thought were appropriate for ketamine analgesia. And I'm not sure what that even means, so I'm not sure how that might incorporate bias. It kind of depends on the culture of your hospital. What I would have liked to see is consecutive recruitment with exclusion criteria for patients that you didn't think it was appropriate to give ketamine to so that this was very transparent and I know which kinds of patients you were applying this to. 
I do really like that they went through the effort to include the placebos and dummy treatments. That was a really nice touch. So overall, we kind of saw that nebulized versus intravenous were pretty much equivalent. Most of the rescue meds were given at 60 to 90 minutes out from the treatment, so they seem to be pretty equivalent early on. One of the problems with using ketamine as an analgesic is that it kind of has a ceiling effect for how much pain relief it's going to give. If your pain is resistant to morphine, you can just keep giving more morphine. If you keep giving more ketamine, then you just dissociate your patient and you're no longer getting more analgesia per se. So there's always that limitation on ketamine as an analgesic. That being said, it works pretty well as well as a weight-based dose of morphine as we've seen from other studies. This is probably a great pain treatment option, nebulized ketamine for EMS. You could give this in an ambulance. It would be very safe, very easy to use, and you don't have to put it in an IV. That sounds pretty good to me. And as far as pain control goes, pretty quick on, quick off if it's only going to last about two hours. So this sounds like a nice option for out of hospital. I will appreciate that there was a pretty wide variety of pain types used in this study. The greatest proportion were abdominal pains, but there was a lot of MSK pains, there was a fair amount of flank pains as well, and then a spattering of others. So this was broadly applicable across many different pain types, which is nice to see because not everything works particularly well in all different types of pain. Now, I'm not saying that I'm going to reach for this very option, but I am very fond of saying that I like having more things in my toolkit, and I'm going to add this to my toolkit. This is a very interesting option. I would like to see this study repeated in a pediatric population where I'm less likely to want to put an IV. So if I can just put a mask on my patient and get morphine level analgesia, that sounds pretty good. I would like to be able to do that. In a spoonful, we already know ketamine to be an effective analgesic. If you give it IV or nebulized, it seems that they're pretty much equivalent, though the nebulized group did have more rescue medications. All right, that's five articles. Let's do a wrap up of everything that we covered from this week. From the second article, duration of fever in febrile infants seems to matter. If they come in within two hours of fever onset, then a lot of the algorithms don't work as well. A lot of the biomarkers don't work as well. However, procalcitonin seems to still work very well, so at least if you have that, you can be a little bit reassured. If not, there's an argument for perhaps waiting at least two hours out from fever onset to draw your bloods. From the fourth article, we saw that nebulized ketamine seems to work about as well as IV ketamine for pain control, which you might expect because really the dose matters and not necessarily the root. However, there were more rescue medications in the nebulized ketamine group. Again, if you are hearing this right now, then you are not a part of the members feed, and so you missed three articles from this past week. What did you miss? Well, we looked at leukopenia and how scary is that in febrile infants. We assessed the overall complication rates for central venous catheter placement, and then we discussed healthcare reform. Links to all the original articles can be found at journalfeed.org or just follow the links in your show notes. Our goal here at the Journal Feed is for you to read less, learn more, and save lives, one spoonful at a time. Thank you. Thank you.